Welcome, everyone. Um, for those of you that's where it's the first uh, keynote today, welcome. And for everyone else, it's great to have you. Great to have you on this uh, on this speech as well. It's going to be Martin Dixon talking about how talking about the industry, talking about the COVID impact of the industry. Martin is uh, head of research product at Drury and also director of uh, of Drury. Um, more than thirty years experience in both on the strategy, but also on the operations side and uh, in, in, in shipping. A lot of work experience, including DHL and Schenke, and a Drury responsible for um, market reports, research products, and whole group wide marketing and sales. Um, personally, I'm super excited uh, to to have uh, Martin from Drury here. Um, I started my career in consulting, and basically the first thing I knew about the industry was uh, there's Drury reports, and they're kind of the industry standard when it comes to shipping data. So I've been working with them for a long time. So wonderful to have you today. Um, um, great to have you. Stage is yours. And um, sorry, one more question, one more point. Um, we will have, uh, of course, the chance to answer questions. Um, please post your questions in the chat on the right hand side. Unless they're super urgent, we would uh, move them towards the end and respond all of these uh, towards the end of this uh, of this keynote. Now, Martin, stage is yours. Thank you very much, Johannes. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all today. So I'm going to provide you with Drury's outlook for the container shipping uh, sector. Um, and I'll uh, and also I'll talk a little bit about how uh, some of our benchmarking tools uh, can help businesses navigate these uh, very uncertain times. And so my starting point then will be to look at the outlook for the shipping trade, uh, then look at the capacity deployment uh, of the carriers, and then the, uh, the availability of container equipment, which is a key part of the supply side equation. And then what all this means then for freight rate development. And, and then I'll then touch on our benchmarking tools, particularly relating to the border benchmarking club. So let's firstly look at the outlook for the trade. Um, and so this chart is then showing you the percentage change in global port throughput, that's container port throughput uh, this year. This is our projection. Um, and, um, and we show that by both globally and by region. And so you can see looking at the right hand side of the chart there that we're projecting that global port throughput will decline this year by uh, just over 7%, uh, which will be the most severe contraction in trade that we've seen since the global recession then of 2009. Um, but the good news is that the, the worst is, is probably over, we think. Uh, so in the second quarter, we think was the bottom of the market um, where the total port throughput crashed by as much as 16%. And we're now seeing an improvement um, from there through the course of the second half of the year. And we expect that to, to continue. However, we, we think, though, that the quarterly year-on-year -year growth rates will remain negative for some time, um, at least it, well into next year, um, until the world adjusts to this um, COVID-19 um, situation. As you can see, also looking at the chart, there's some quite big variations in the impact of the recession then on different uh, regions of the world. Um, some regions were less bad, less affected by COVID-19. Others um, show a better relative performance, perhaps because they're, they're, they're coming off a weak 2019 and therefore the year on year comparison um, is, uh, is altered slightly. So moving on into the next slide, uh, this shows you the um, various scenarios that we've looked at in terms of how the trade may evolve, really dependent on how the uh, COVID-19 pandemic develops itself, which will obviously be a big driver of global economic growth and therefore the overall shipping trade. Um, so our baseline forecast, which that scenario is shown for you at the top, and we think there's a 50% probability of that playing out, and so far, that has played out uh, when we did these forecasts back at the end of June. And so they show a rebound uh, next year uh, of around 10% in the trade um, and then subsequent growth uh, thereafter, equating to 3.5% annualized growth over the five years uh, to, um, to 2024. Um, and with that, we'd expect then some normalization in the markets in terms of capacity deployment and freight rate development. We're seeing capacity coming back, but we're not, freight rates are still very volatile and still uh, very high, and we'll come on to that a bit later. However, there's huge uncertainty then with how 
uh, the global economy and this pandemic will play out. Um, and we've therefore looked at a number of other more severe scenarios. Uh, we're already seeing um, infection rates rising in parts of Europe um, and other key markets such as uh, North America, uh, India and Brazil, for example, have high infection rates which are impacting the economies there. So therefore, uh, if you take our worst case scenario, uh, which is where we'd have a longer outbreak in 2020, and there's some concerns around that at the moment, and then further outbreaks certainly through 2021, uh, this could then lead to a contraction next year of 12% on top of the 7% we've seen this year, and further contraction in the subsequent years uh, following that. This next slide then uh, illustrates the impact of these different scenarios on the percentage change uh, in the container shipping trade. So each color represents the different scenarios. So the black, dark blue, blue bars show uh, our baseline scenario. Um, and then the other colors show the other scenarios down to the most severe uh, scenario I just painted to you just now, which is shown by those green bars and the continuing contraction in trade uh, in subsequent years. OK, so let's move on to see then um, uh, look at the capacity deployment. And firstly, this first chart then is tracking the overall development of shipping capacity relative to cargo demand. So the uh, light blue line is tracking uh, cargo demand or world uh, port throughput and the percentage change in that. Uh, and the, the uh, uh, dark blue line is tracking the development of the container shipping fleet. Um, and you, at, at the moment, we reckon the total fleet amounts to around 23 million TEU. We project that by the end of the year, the fleet would have grown uh, by 2.6%. So pretty modest growth, frankly, by historical standards, but obviously a huge gap then created with the contraction of demand. So uh, the difference uh, of over 9% between the growth uh, of the fleet relative to the contraction in demand. The delivery of new ships, though, has slowed a lot this year. This is partly because COVID-19 closed a lot of the shipyards earlier in the year. Um, uh, but also, we, we expect, therefore, slippage rates to be, um, to be very high this year um, as um, owners seek to delay delivery of vessels. Um, in, uh, and, um, and we, therefore, we expect the deliveries to be as low as 740 thousand TEU, which will represent just 65% of the scheduled delivery of ships um, that was scheduled at the start of the year. This will push then um, around 400,000 TEU deliveries into 2021. Um, and, and therefore, you, that's why you see a slight uptick then in the growth in the fleet. Uh, but then uh, there again, we expect some of that, those deliveries to be deferred again into the subsequent years. The other factor of the fleet is the rate of demolition, which slowed a lot at the start of the year because the uh, scrapyards were closed in Southeast Asia uh, because of the growth in the virus. Um, we expect, though, um, we're seeing scrapping picking up, though, but we don't expect it to reach uh, significant levels to change uh, this outlook. Uh, what has also been happening is vessel ordering has been slowing significantly. Um, it has slowed further now with the development of the pandemic, which has slowed reduce then the propensity for placing orders. Um, and we don't think that ordering will return at any great speed until the latent overcapacity is addressed. Uh, we also think that the uh, continuing uncertainty regard to um, uh, environmental regulation and the uh, propulsion technology to comply with that regulation will slow up ordering until some of these propulsion technologies uh, become uh, clearer and, and more um, commercialized. The, the way that the carriers have then coped with this uh, huge overcapacity uh, situation, and as I said to you earlier, we expect this overcapacity in the market to continue for some years to come, well beyond 2024, the uh, forecast uh, period horizon that we work to. Um, so therefore, in the interim, then, carriers are having to manage uh, the um, uh, this overcapacity through uh, the idling of vessels. So we estimate that um, in the first quarter, as much as 10% of the uh, fleet was idled. Uh, this was a similar 
uh, proportion to how it was in 2009. Um, but obviously, in terms of the actual uh, number of uh, volume of TEU or number of ships, much greater than 2009 because the fleet was growing quite a lot. So what this chart here is tracking is the weekly um, level of uh, cancelled sailings. Um, and you can see that the way that they have fallen quite significantly, but at the start of the, the well, certainly in the uh, beginning of the second quarter, they were extremely high uh, to the extent that as much as 30% of sailings on certain trade lanes were cancelled at that time. And we now estimate that has reduced down to as little as 3% um, over that period. The degree of capacity disciplined by the carriers has been quite an unprecedented by historical standards. Some of that has been driven really by financial necessity. Carriers were really forced to park up capacity as they did in 2009, uh, otherwise they were likely to go bust. Um, but I think that uh, since the emergency um, situation has, um, has receded, um, this capacity discipline has continued. And I think then that the recent spate of M&A activity uh, has led to greater market concentration and has therefore enabled uh, a smaller group of carriers to be able to control capacity more effectively. And also the formation of these bigger alliances um, has enabled the carriers to develop much more streamlined capacity responses uh, to those that they may have had uh, previously. Another driver of the idling of the fleet earlier in the year was the big queue of ships waiting to have uh, scrubbers retrofitted. So we estimate that the portion of the fleet fitted with these scrubbers now represents about 20% of the global fleet. Um, we think though that propensity to fit, to, to refit more vessels in the fleet will slow now because of the price differential between high and low sulfur fuel has narrowed uh, and is much narrower now than was originally uh, projected. Also, there are certain there's some uh, concerns that uh, certain types of scrubbers uh, may uh, become uh, outlawed in certain territorial waters uh, because of concerns um, over the environmental impacts of their use. Okay, so let's move on then to look at the container equipment availability, which has been in tight supply in recent times, um, particularly aggravated by the uh, disruption to trade and subsequently to that to uh, carrier service schedules. But uh, an overall measure then of the uh, availability of shipping containers is the development of the fleet of containers relative to shipping capacity. And that's what this chart is then showing you here. So the dark blue bars shows you the size of the container equipment fleet, that's the size of the number of uh, shipping containers of all types, dry, dry boxes, um, reefer boxes and tanks, etc. cetera. Um, and that's measured in TEU and that's shown relative to these uh, gray bars, which is the uh, vessel fleet um, vessel slot capacity. And then that yellow line is tracking what we call the operating ratio, which is the ratio of the number of shipping containers per slot. Where that ratio is, is low, it means that the conditions in the market are tight. That means their equipment availability will become tight. Where that ratio then rises, uh, the market becomes less tight and the availability of shipping containers theoretically then improves. Um, and so what you can see looking at this chart is that actually the pace of growth of the container equipment fleet has not been as fast as the growth in the uh, vessel capacity. So in fact, in 2019, for example, whereas the vessel capacity grew by around 4%, uh, the growth in the um, container equipment fleet was around 3%. And in this year, we are going to see the container equipment fleet contract, we project by 3%. Uh, and as I've already explained to you, we expect the a vessel fleet to grow by 2.6%. So that will lead to a further widening uh, of the gap there. And therefore, you will see this operating ratio fall. And the chart shows it falls to a reading of 1.76, which is very low uh, by historical standards. But subsequent to that, we anticipate that the equipment fleet will grow at a faster pace uh, than that of the uh, vessel fleet. 
um, and therefore we will see his operating ratio improve and therefore we will see the tightness in the market and the availability of equipment uh, to become better in subsequent years. So I think this helps to explain some of the issues that we've experienced, that, that the market has experienced in terms of equipment availability. And this information comes from Drury's uh, Container Census and Leasing Annual Report. Okay, another uh, development that could uh, help alleviate some of the issues with regard to container equipment is the proportion of the fleet which is fitted with smart devices. Um, and so this chart here is tracking Drury's estimate and future projections of the size of the smart container fleet. So a container becomes smart when it's fitted with an electronic device that is able to transmit information uh, and alerts about its location or condition of the cargo by the use of mobile technology. Um, and uh, at the end of 2019, we estimate that around one in 35 containers were fitted with these smart devices, um, which represented about 2.7% of the overall fleet um, and um, in terms of the fleet the developments of the smart uh, uh, smart container fleet uh, we saw pretty strong growth last year of around 20 percent but we think that this year the fleet of smart containers has stagnated really as COVID-19 has stalled investment in the installation of new devices now as you can see looking at the different colors in the bars the um, penetration of the different segments of the fleet does vary a lot. So in the dry freight sector, which is by far uh, the um, biggest in terms of the total number of containers in the fleet, the penetration rate is tiny. It's about 0.7 percent. There's seen to be much less value in fitting dry freight containers with, with the smart devices. But for a reefer containers, for example, it's as high as around 23% at the moment, we estimate. So going forward, we think though, we think that there will be an acceleration in the adoption of these smart devices, particularly across the reefer fleet and some of the regional fleets. Um, and we will see that the a threefold increase, we think, in the number of these smart containers, um, which will take the total to around 2,000 units uh, by 2024, representing almost six and a half percent of the total fleet. So we think that the more the fleets are fitted with these smart devices, the more it enables the operators to improve the efficiency of that fleet and therefore the availability of those containers. Okay, let's move on to look at the freight rate outlook. Firstly, looking at the recent trends. So this chart is tracking Drury's east-west uh, freight rates index. This is a weighted average of spot rates across the main east-west trades. So the uh, blue line is tracking uh, rate development through last year and the yellow line the rate development so far this year. And you can see it's a tale of two completely different years. There's been a very rapid rise in freight rate levels through the course of the second and third quarters, propelled principally by the soaring rates on the eastbound Trans-Pacific uh, where rate levels uh, to the west coast uh, the currently are two and a half times the level that they were at uh, this time last year, um, and rates to the east coast are 60% higher. Uh, and if you then look at the Asia-Europe trade, rates are currently 25% up. And on the backhaul trade from Europe to Asia, rate levels are double those that they were a year ago, according to Drury's estimates. And all, all this has been driven by the tightening of capacity conditions uh, as carriers have, have taken uh, capacity um, out of the market. Now, it is quite possible, we think then, that earlier in the year, carriers may have overestimated the amount of capacity to remove, and therefore that led to a big spike in rates. And having taken rates up uh, this high, carriers have been loath then to, uh, um, to allow excess capacity in the market to weaken uh, rate levels. Um, and obviously, this has created a lot of concern amongst uh, forwarders and shippers in regard to access to capacity um, um, and the uh, freight rate levels. So that brings us on then to look at what does this mean then for the freight rate outlook. So this uh, chart then is showing you the development of average annual freight rates, including both spot and contract rates, 
uh, on across all deep sea trades or global trades. And that's shown by the light blue line. And the dark blue line is tracking uh, uh, average rate levels at an annualized basis um, on the main east-west trades. When we ran these forecasts last back in June, which is what we're showing you here, so we'll be updating these um, later this month, we were projecting that overall rate levels would rise this year by around 3% and then fall by a similar margin um, next year. So we thought that um, through the second half of this year that rate levels would reduce as more capacity was brought back into the market, carrying a discipline, discipline with wane, and therefore uh, there would be um, a slight fall off in rate levels. Now we haven't seen that, or at least we haven't seen it yet. When we uh, rerun these forecasts, uh, we are likely to project a steeper climb in rates this year, as we are seeing spot rates particularly continuing to rise. Um, contract rates have been obviously have been less affected, um, but we think that contract rates will rise next year. So as, as the negotiations start on the annual contract rates for the Asia Europe trade, we're expecting those to rise. Trans-Pacific eastbound rates which are negotiated um, later in the, in the middle of next year, uh, we would expect those to rise too, depending on what happens with the spot market. But we think the spot market is likely to see some uh, reduction in rate levels through the towards the end of the year and into next year um, as more capacity is released into the market and the, and the, the market then starts to normalise. Okay, moving on then to how can... Um, Brief interruption from Johannes here, Martin. Um, we have uh, eight minutes left and would love to save also some time for questions at the end. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Johannes. Okay. So just moving on then to a um, uh, brief look at some of Drury's benchmarking tools and how they can help, uh, particularly forwarders in this case, navigate these uh, choppy waters. Um, the idea of this service is to uh, enable freight forwarders to be able to buy capacity better by being able to compare their uh, ocean freight buy rates um, with the wider market. Also, they can use this service to price better by better understanding the margin opportunity between their carrier buy rates um, and, their, uh, and the market rates. And thirdly, they can use this as a selling tool where it's advantageous for them to do so to demonstrate the co competitiveness of the rates they're offering their clients um, by comparing those with these Drury benchmarks. So the, it, it is a club in which freight forwarders share their carrier buy rates with Drury confidentially and anonymously, and then we receive back from Drury a benchmarking report showing how their rates then compare with, with the market. The club is now well established and we now cover over 4,000 port pairs. We have in excess of 70 members of the service and they're collectively then moving in excess of 10 million TU of cargo, uh, representing a spend of over, over eight and a half billion dollars a year. Um, and the service then enables the each forwarder to get a report that, that shows them how their rates compare with the average uh, of rates in the market, but also the lowest and the highest rates. So you can identify the range of rates in the market and also where the, the rates of each forwarder uh, ranks relative to those of other forwarders. And then there are other bits of information provided as part of the service, including analysis of the financial stability of, of container carriers, which is significant at the moment, given the, the state of the market, and also access to um, briefings which are only available to our subscribers and the service is completely free of charge um, to early adopters uh, so if you join now it's free of charge to join and it remains free of charge uh, for life so long as you remain a member this is only uh, the offer open for a time limited period so this screenshot illustrates then the detail that you receive. I won't go into the detail of it now, but obviously you can get access to this presentation and have a look at that at your uh, leisure. Um, and the information shared by members remains entirely confidential and uh, anonymous. So the benefit of the service is that it enables a freight forwarder to buy better, 
to price better and to sell better. So this brings me then to my conclusions, and I'm just going to summarize then the main market outlook um, yeah. points that I made, which is firstly that we see that the trade is recovering, um, but the outlook remains very uncertain. Uh, the market remains heavily oversupplied and will do in, in well beyond 2024, and therefore carrier capacity discipline will be key uh, to ensuring uh, market stability uh, and, and certainly that of freight rate development. Container equipment availability has tightened this year, um, according to our measures, um, but it is likely to improve in subsequent years. Um, and the availability of container equipment may well improve as the proportion of containers fitted with smart devices increases as we project. And we, we, see, contra we see spot rates uh, probably declining over the short term, but contract rates are likely to rise. Over to you, Johannes. <laughs> Thank you, Juan. Thank you very much for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Great insights into the into the market. Thanks a lot. And actually, we did have some questions coming in through the presentation. Maybe I'll just start kind of just reading out the first one. First question was whether the intra-Asia uh, trade has been more resilient through the crisis, and if yes, why, and whether you do see this to continue or not. So that's intra-Asia. Uh, I think the, the, the answer to that is yes, it has been more resilient. Uh, the the reason, uh, principal reason, is that the Asian economies, notwithstanding the impact on China right at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but since then the Asian economies have actually been less affected by the COVID-19 outbreak and therefore that's less impacted their economies. And hence, therefore, there's been more, more trade activity uh, between those countries. So yes, the intra-Asia trade uh, has certainly been less affected. Having said that, though, uh, a lot of the services on intra-Asia trades are provided uh, through the Asia, on Asia Europe mainline services. And because those services have been disrupted, uh, the, um, the services offered on intra-Asia trades have seen some disruption as well. So it's been slightly mixed. Uh, but the trade the demand itself has, has been relatively uh, strong relative to the other trades. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Um, of course, any other questions that are coming in, please please type them on the right hand side. And um, there's there's another question on regarding the Trans-Pacific route. Um, whether your thoughts on the earlier peak season witnessed on Trans-Pacific, whether that's going to remain strong beyond October this year. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's very difficult to tell at the moment because of the um, the uncertainty with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic and what impact that will have on the US economy. Um, but I think one would certainly expect there to be some slowdown because there is, there is a peak, we are in the middle of peak season. You would normally uh, see a slowdown uh, from uh, after October anyway, a seasonal slowdown. So we would expect that to be the case. I think the big question then is what happens to the trade uh, beyond that in terms of the uh, seasonally adjusted development. Um, I think uh, we're likely to see some weakening there, um, given the uh, the COVID-19 and the economic development at the moment. Great. Thank you. How do you um, see... Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, sorry, I was going to read out another question, but, but you, as we, you go ahead and do that. No, I want to do exactly the same. You're much better at reading it out than me, so go ahead. Well, I, I don't think so, but um, so there's a question here about um, uh, is this forecast different from the last forecast Drury made in the industry? Well, it's the, the forecast that I provided uh, is the outlook. We, we, we run these forecasts every quarter. So the last forecast was done at the end of June. Uh, I think we gave a webinar to um, to the markets uh, shortly after that. And so the, the forecasts provided here are, are broadly similar to that. I think what I've tried to do is to provide some uh, nuanced update around that. And obviously, we, we certainly we think we'll be re-looking at the outlook for freight rate development as that certainly is that situation has changed a bit since we uh, uh, we, we ran that those, those forecasts. Okay, there's a further question here. Shippers are saying that the lines are profiting, profiteering now after reducing capacity earlier in the year. Um, 
I think that, I think as I said to you earlier, this is quite a contentious issue, so I need to be careful what I say, but I think that the, uh, as I said earlier, I think that um, carriers did take more capacity from the trade than they probably needed to, but I think that that's because they were concerned about the, the contraction and demand. It was, it was uh, certainly a pretty scary time for a lot of people. And I think that since then, there's been a reluctance to let the uh, freight, rate, rate, freight rates uh, fall and therefore to hold on to this capacity discipline. We still think, uh, though, that as the trade normalizes and as the trade volumes return to some kind of normality, assuming that it does in the near term, it will become harder for carriers to continue to maintain this level of carrier discipline. And we therefore, that's why we think that spot rates probably will start to fall off a bit uh, in the subsequent months. I think through peak season, we will continue to see uh, pretty tight capacity conditions and um, and strong freight rates, certainly on, in the spot market. But I think after that, I think uh, we'd like to see some easing in the market. Great. Thanks a lot, Martin. Thanks again. Thank you all for your questions and attending. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, for sure. And, <laughs> and uh, have a wonderful rest of the Container Summit. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks Johannes. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.